We'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Marissa Lozano. I'm the Director of Community Education at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Thank you for joining us today. Today's session is part of our Planning for College series. This series will provide attendees with an overview of the types of support available at college, how to identify and connect with those supports, as well as important timelines and resources to help you prepare for college. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for on demand viewing in just a few weeks. All phone lines have been muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to utilize the chat feature. You can find it at the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, my colleague Sarah will also be adding links to helpful resources into the chat today. So be sure to take a look at the chat every now and then. We'd like to thank our program supporter, Edgewise Therapeutics for their generous support of today's program. Our supporters help make programs like this possible. We always like to lead with our mission. Uh, for nearly 75 years, MDA has led the way in funding research to accelerate the development of new treatments, expanding access to care and clinical trials through our care center network, and advocating for access and inclusion for the neuromuscular disease community. We deliver on our mission through reset research, excuse me, research, access to care, advocacy, education, recreation, and engagement. Uh, we have MDA care centers located at over 150 top medical institutions nationwide, providing care from clinicians who specialize in neuromuscular disease. Our advocacy work focuses on support for accelerated approvals and novel research, access to healthcare, accessible air travel, and more. Our community education and recreation programs are designed to connect individuals and families. We are committed to building a nurturing environment where our members can share experiences, triumphs, and challenges. Uh, last year, we offered over 40 educational programs, over 20 summer camps, and dozens of other community activities. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to join the MDA community by registering with us. Registering is free. Uh, please see the link in the chat, and as always, to learn more about MDA, visit mda.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Annie Tolkien is the founder and director of Accessible College, as well as an educator, author, and public speaker. She is an expert in the area of college preparation and transition for students with physical disabilities and health conditions, and supports students and families across the country. Annie was the Associate Director of the Academic Resource Center at Georgetown University for nearly six years. In that position, she supported undergraduate, graduate, and medical students with physical disabilities and health conditions, and oversaw academic support services for the entire, um, oh, I lost my spot, I'm so sorry, Annie, <laughs> for the entire student body. Annie has worked in the disability field for her entire professional career, including positions as a regional disability coordinator for Humanitas, working on the Job Corps Disability Support Contract for the Department of Labor, and as a project specialist with the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, where she worked with both the National Service Inclusion Project and University Centers of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities Technical Assistant Projects. She holds a bachelor's degree in secondary education, a master's in special education, and Annie was a Peace Corps volunteer and a Fulbright Fellow. She resides in Silver Spring, Maryland with her husband and daughter. Next, we have Adrienne Fromberg. She's the founder of Lighthouse Guidance. Lighthouse Guidance was created to help students with disabilities, mental health issues, and health conditions find the right college fit. She is permanently certified school counselor in New York State and has 17 years of experience as a college counselor. Before starting Lighthouse Guidance, she worked at various independent schools as a school counselor in the New York City area. During this time, Adrienne discovered her true passion for helping students with special circumstances find post-secondary success. Adrienne and Annie have been collaborating since 2020 to help students with physical disabilities and health conditions navigate the college and transition process. Between the two of you, you have a lot of experience and we are so excited to learn from you today. So thank you for being here, Annie and Adrian, and I will turn the time over to you. Great, thanks, Marissa. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen. Give me one second to get that going. 
All right, things are happening on my end. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and Marissa did a fabulous job of introducing Adrian and myself. So I don't think we need to go into this too much, but um, I will just say that part of what um, I'm bringing to the conversation here today is um, I, I wore the hat of a university administrator in a disability support office. And we should say that every college has a disability support office or a person who is tasked with providing accommodations for students with disabilities on campus. Um, and so, um, you know, that is something that is a little bit different from the high school setting. And in my role at Georgetown in the disability support office there, one of the things that was really um, evident to me was that so many students were coming in to the university without really knowing what types of accommodations they could request in the college setting. They hadn't really thought about their uh, their needs, their independent living needs, what personal care would look like. Um, and so that's why I started Accessible College to address some of those needs. Adrian, I'll, I'll toss it to you for a second if you wanna say anything just about your background um, and expertise. Sure, thanks so much, Annie. So again, Marissa went through a lot of these details, but um, the reason I started Lighthouse Guidance um, was because I discovered my passion for helping those students who who have special circumstances, whether those be um, reasons of physical disability, a health condition, um, you know, maybe they sought um, treatment during high school that uh, precluded them from being in person. Um, you know, some of my clients have high school online, so really anyone you know kind of under that umbrella with a special circumstance. So, my main goal is not necessarily to for the student to get into the you know, top rated institution, but rather to find the right college fit for their particular needs. Great. Um, and, and we are going to cover a lot today. Um, and we're going to talk about the laws. We're going to talk about post secondary options, um, timeline for planning for college, accommodations and support. And of course, we're going to share some takeaway resources that hopefully you can utilize um, with your student. And I'd also like to say that um, if you have questions, feel free to pop those into the chat. There will be some time for questions at the end too. So um, as things emerge, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, the first thing that we're starting with today is the Americans with Disabilities Act, right? So um, the ADA is the law that governs college accommodations and the ADA defines a person as a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. So when a person in a disability support office is connecting with a student to talk about accommodations in the college setting, they're really looking at how does that condition, how does that disability impact the student? What are the functional limitations that the student experiences that they'll need accommodations for? Um, something really important to know that the laws change from high school to college. High school falls under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That's the law that governs special education and services and supports for students with disabilities in the K through 12 setting. Um, IDEA does not apply to private schools, but section 504, which is the next law that I have down here, does apply to private and public schools. And section 504 is an anti-discrimination law. It says that students cannot be discriminated against because they have a disability. So that gives students with disabilities access to education. It applies to private schools, it applies to K through 12 schools, and there's a subsection that applies to college as well. Um, if your student has an IEP, an individualized education program, that comes from IDEA, that law. If, you're set, if your student has a 504 plan in high school, that comes from section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. IEPs have services and supports built into them. So your student might have, if they have an IEP, they might have speech therapy, they might get orientation and mobility training in addition to accommodations like um, extra time on tests or a note taker. That is part of IDEA. Section 504, they might just have the accommodations, right? So things like um, extra time on a test, note taker, things like that without services. The ADA is the law of the land when it comes to college and the ADA provides for reasonable accommodations. And I'm doing air quotes here because um, what is reasonable can kind of vary based on the program that the student is in, the physical space as it exists on that college campus, 
Um, so there's a lot of variability in a reasonable accommodation setting, which is why it's important for students and parents to investigate schools and think about the students' needs up front so that you are going into the college search process uh, with questions and you can make better informed decisions once you have that information. Not all college disability support offices are created equal. Not all disability support offices are the same or will evaluate things the same. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today and sort of what that looks like. It should also be noted that the ADA applies to the employment setting as well. So if your student is thinking maybe about a vocational training program, or if they're thinking about going into um, an employment setting, um, the ADA is a law that protects people with disabilities in employment settings. People can request reasonable accommodations in the workplace as well. FERPA is the final law that we have here. That's the Educational Rights and Privacy Act. That's the law that protects the privacy of the student's educational record. Um, when a student matriculates to college, signs that dotted line, commits to the university that they want to go to, the student is the main driver at that point. Um, that means that parents, guardians do not get information that maybe they had access to when the student was in high school, like their grades, their educational record, their attendance record, all of those things. When the student's in college, that's all on them. They get all of that information. Um, and parents, guardians sometimes feel like, well, maybe if I'm paying the bill, I should get that information. That's a conversation that students and parents should have together. There is such a thing as a FERPA waiver where a parent or a guardian might be able to access the student's information, but the student and the parent have to you know, agree to that and the student has to sign off on that and there's a process in each university setting for that. I'm going to hand it over to Adrian to talk a little bit about planning for college. Hey, thank you so much, Annie. So um, we're here today to talk about what does college look like today? So in terms of thinking about life after high school, there are a lot of different paths that students and families can consider. So firstly, we must think about, you know, sort of what is your end goal? So for some of my students, they say, you know, I, I definitely want to study psychology or I hope one day to go to law school. So you know, based on what the student's end goal is, we can then go from there to figure out what we should do for the, the college years or the post-secondary years. So again, the bachelor's degree, that's the four-year college degree that students would be applying for during the senior year of high school, traditionally. Um, and then if someone is interested in pursuing an associate's degree, um, that's something that falls under like a two-year college or otherwise known as a community college. So there is an application that goes along with the community college as well, but it, it tends to be much easier and shorter as compared to the four year college application. So if someone you know, isn't sure they wanna go the full four year route, some of my students will start out with the two year degree um, and those credits that you earn during community college or if you're pursuing an associate's degree, can actually transfer transfer to a four year college. So if you're not sure that the four year degree is for you, um, I will say that some students say, like, let me start out slowly and, you know, let's start with the two year community college degree first um, and take it from there. Um, one thing to note about community college is that um, depending where you live and, you know, what community colleges are local to your home, oftentimes community college, um, they might not provide um, housing. So that's something to think about. Some students say, I want to live at home um, and that works for them. So that's just something to note um, and to look into with your local community college. The third bullet point I have here is a non-degree student. And so for anyone who graduates high school and earns a high school diploma, you would be permitted to enroll in a college as a non-degree student. Every college has certain red tape around this, but generally speaking, you would be filling out a short application um, to just simply take classes at a college. You would not be seeking a degree. You would not be a degree seeking student at the institution, but you could take one or two classes. And this works really well for someone who isn't entirely sure what they're ready for. So, you know, taking a couple of classes, walk uh, before you run or get your foot, you know, wet before jumping in the pool, trying it out as a non-degree student is a great first step um, that some of my students will take advantage of. Um, the fourth bullet point is part-time student. 
Um, if you are a degree seeking student at either a 2 year or a 4 year college, a part time student would usually be someone who's below 12 credits um, and that would be. Um, most college classes are around 3 credits. So if you're taking 1, 2 or 3 classes, you are probably falling under the designation of part time student. So that also works well for students who, you know, kind of want that. That slower start to school, or, uh, you know, I have some students who say, you know, maybe they want to uh, hold a job um, during college and go to school part time um, and work um, or just simply focus on health and wellness um, and then, you know, do that 1 or 2 class option again, you know, many students now I know there is that thought of finishing college in a certain number of years, but again, you know, it, doing it slowly and intentionally can be a, a great choice. Um, the next bullet point I have here is a gap year option. Um, there is definitely a growing trend among uh, students and families to consider taking a gap year um, between graduating high school and going to college. And what a gap year is, um, is a year where a student can do many different things. Um, you know, that could be involving volunteer work. Um, it could be um, getting a job. It could be traveling. It could be many different sorts of things. There are many gap year programs that are out there. One um, website that I would definitely check out would be um, called the Gap Year Association. And that website indicates um, programs that are accredited and not accredited and give you sort of like the details of what the programs look like, you know, what happens on a week to week basis, things of that nature. So I will um, drop that in the chat and it's probably on the resource link later in the presentation. And then finally, um, the, oh, thank you for, to Sarah for dropping that in there. Um, the final bullet point here is vocational training. So for some students, they have a very specific idea of what they would like to pursue if they know um, a particular job or trade that they're interested in, um, that can be directly after high school. Those um, vocational training programs can often be shorter in length and can lead to wonderful job placement as well. Next slide. Thanks, Amy. Okay, so to go through a timeline for post secondary planning, I know probably everyone who's here in the presentation, um, you're all at different points. So I'll run through um, the timeline here of generally the things that you um, and your child should be thinking about during high school. So during ninth grade, obviously you're adjusting to high school life, um, getting involved in, in different organizations that um, your high school sponsors or school sanctioned clubs is a great idea to um, begin to discover things that you're interested in, passions, um, maybe even areas that you might be interested in studying. Some high schools have, um, you know, like a, a pre-health club or a business club, things like that can help you take what might be an interest and then, you know, something that you might be really interested in studying down the line. So getting involved, um, I often suggest students and families uh, maintain a Google Doc with, you know, the things that you've been involved in during high school, because by the time you get to 12th grade, you might not necessarily remember what you've been involved in um, in ninth grade. Um, scheduling a lot of time to study. So, of course, you know, the most important thing when a student is applying to college is their report card and their transcript and how they've done in high school. So making sure to do the best that you can academically and taking classes that are appropriately challenging for you. Again, you don't want to be drowning in work, but it is important to challenge yourself appropriately. Um, considering the summer, um, whether, you know, I have some students who will work as a camp counselor or get a job or take a class, doing something over the summer, whatever it might be that is engaging for you. Um, you know, of course, it's important to take some time to rest and decompress, but also doing something valuable over the summer is important. Registering with the College Board. So the College Board website um, is it provides a lot of great information. This is the website where students will register for the SAT for their um, AP exams if that is something that they're interested in. College Board also has some great tools. Um, there's something called the Big Future tool on the College Board, which can help students um, look at particular um, factors that are going into their college decision. So. Registering with this during ninth grade is something that I recommend. It is sometimes hard to remember your password, so highly recommend using your phone to store your password. 
I can't tell you how many students that I've worked with who forget that password. So um, definitely store that one. Um, volunteer work, that is something that, you know, I would recommend students consider doing during ninth grade. There are a lot of clubs at your school probably that allow you to engage in volunteer work. And that's something that looks um, great on your resume and is just, you know, can be personally fulfilling to start that as early as ninth grade. Um, and then finally, on, on the ninth grade timeline, I, I added um, attending IEP 504 or transition meetings. So definitely important to not just be the parent there, but the student there too, to be listening to if it is an IEP meeting, what are the goals? What are the things that you're working on? Um, you know, taking ownership over um, your accommodations at an earlier age can definitely help make that transition from high school to college a smooth one. Um, in 10th grade, as I mentioned, you know, before taking a strong course load is, is definitely advisable, pushing yourself appropriately. If your high school offers um, an honors or an AP class or an accelerated class, and you know, you're really passionate about history, give it a try uh, and see how that goes. Um, meeting with the guidance counselor is, is a great thing as well, because down the line, your guidance counselor will be the, run, the one writing you a counselor letter of recommendation. Um, again, continuing either, you know, continuing the activities you were involved in in ninth grade or trying something new. Um, that's definitely a great way to continue to build the resume. Um, taking a practice standardized test, depending on your high school, you may have an opportunity in even ninth or 10th grade to take a PSAT. Um, there is something called like the PSAT 9, PSAT 10, which are leveled for students of those grades. So that's a great way to to see if you are going to be someone who uses standardized testing as a part of your college application. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but since 2020, many of the colleges are test optional and have maintained that test optional designation. This means that if you don't want to take a standardized test or you took the test and it didn't go well, you do not have to uh, share your score as a part of your college application. They would just simply focus on your transcript and um, your grades as the primary decision maker for your admission to college. Um, one website that I would recommend for looking at the test optional colleges is fairtest.org, and it's the full list of colleges that are currently test optional. And then um, I'll, with 10th grade, again, just continuing to plan something over the summer. Some of my students will go um, to pre-college programs on college campuses. Um, that's just, a, again, people always ask, does that help me get into that college? No, the answer is no, it doesn't help you gain admission, but it gives you a chance to see what it's like to live in a, a dorm and see what it's like to live on a college campus and take a class in something you'd like. Um, during 11th grade, um, you would be taking the actual PSAT and MSQT. That's the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. So for students who do well on the PSAT, um, you know, that is the year that it technically counts. Um, you know, if you um, do do well on it, you know, you could possibly be named um, a, a scholarship qualifying winner. Um, taking the ACT or the SAT in the spring, most students do take the actual S SAT or ACT in the spring of their junior year. The reasoning behind that is generally, um, you know, that students need to learn enough in their math classes to be prepared for what the content happens to be on the test. Um, the In March of 2020, for those of you who aren't aware, the SAT began their electronic administration and is now um, solely um, administered on, um, on a computer-based test. Um, certainly for um, accommodations, you know, students are still able to apply for their accommodations for the SAT and the ACT. ACT still maintains um, its paper test form um, and will continue to do so. I have been hearing that they will possibly move online as well. Um, but just note for both SAT and ACT, if you are looking to get accommodations, um, that can take around seven weeks to get approval. So if you know you want to take those tests, make sure that you are completing the accommodation request early on. And then once you get the approval once for that test, beyond that, however many times you want to take the test, the accommodations will remain uh, there for you to utilize. And during 11th grade, visiting colleges, looking um, at scholarships, and beginning to develop a college list um, that includes reach, target, and likely schools, a balanced list is really important in today's environment. Um, certainly, um, 
uh, students really like to add a lot of colleges under that reach category, but um, my job is to really help students find colleges in all three categories that they can feel excited about. Um, if there's someone who is interested in art or theater, you may need portfolios or auditions. Um, so those are sort of separate areas um, that require some additional time. Um, and the end of 11th grade students should plan to have um, two academic letters of recommendation um, secured. Some colleges, you don't need any, some you need one, but it's best to just ask two teachers who can speak to your strengths um, to complete those letters of rec for you um, during end of junior year. And then between 11th and 12th grade in the summer, it's great to spend time working on applications and essays so you can go back senior year um, and focus on doing well. Um, so during 12th grade, again, you know, continuing to take standardized tests in the fall if you need to, applying for financial aid, um, the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid, opens October 1st. Um, so that is something that, that families um, should do on the earlier side so they can make sure that they have the full information that they need um, to review their financial aid options. And then completing all their applications early action, which means it's a non binding application deadline is usually November 1st. Um, early decision is a binding deadline. If you are accepted and you find out in December, you have to attend and then regular decision is in January, find out in March and you make your decision by May of senior year. Um, and as I noted here, May 1st is national decision day. All right. Longest slide ever is over. <laughs> um, so in terms of what we know about college, um, approximately 21% of undergraduate students report having a disability. So under that umbrella includes learning disabilities, ADD, ADHD, mobility, psychiatric, or health conditions. And 6% uh, of those students indicate they have a physical disability or mobility impairment. So the truth is, is that most of the disabilities or accessibility offices on campus are interacting with more students with learning disabilities and ADHD. So there are fewer students coming on campus with physical disabilities and health conditions. Um, it is important, Annie, and I will probably touch on this later on in the presentation, is that, um, you know, it is important if you are seeking accommodations for housing um, and things like that, um, registering with the disabilities office soon after depositing at the college is is a wise choice to make. And again, at most colleges, between 10 and 20% of undergraduates are receiving some kind of accommodations. Um, now we are going to talk about accommodations, documentation, and support. Um, and hopefully this will be uh, helpful for all of you um, so that you can better understand sort of what the expectations are. There is a big myth that goes around in high schools, which is that IEPs transfer to college. IEPs do not transfer to college. 504 plans do not transfer to college. Neither of those things follow your student to college. Every college has their own documentation guidelines and process for requesting accommodations. The first part of that might be to establish a disability. So what does that mean? So at different schools, um, you might go to the university's disability support office website. I mentioned every college has one. It could be called student accessibility services, student disability services, disability support services. They all have different names. You can go to the university's main home website and just put in disability support and usually it'll come right up. Um, so if your student has a learning disability, because we know that a lot of students have co-occurring conditions, right? So they might have um, a neuromuscular condition and a learning disability or a mental health condition and a neuromuscular condition. So um, if it's a learning disability, the school will likely want a neuropsych evaluation, the full evaluation, and they usually want it done in the last three years so that it has the adult scale so that it's, it's recent and accurate. Again, every college is different in what they require, so you'll wanna go to the website and see what they put down as their documentation requirements, or you'll give them a call and have a conversation what documentation is required. Um, if a student has a mental health condition, it could be a psychological evaluation or a letter from their therapist or mental health provider. Um, for most students with physical disabilities, with muscular dystrophy, with other neuromuscular conditions, it's likely going to be a letter from their healthcare provider that outlines what their diagnosis is, 
what the functional limitations are, so how that condition impacts them, and the recommendation of accommodations. Um, you'll have to contact the college to see sort of what types of documentation they might um, require your student to, to submit. And you can also submit the IEP, the 504 plan, the letter from the high school, the ACT or SAT accommodations. Those are all supplemental documentations. They might be beneficial for the people in the disability support office to see, but they're usually not accepted as primary documentation of a disability. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I think Marissa noted this in the beginning. So through my business, Accessible College, I support students with physical disabilities. So wheelchair users, mobility device users, and students with chronic health conditions. So uh, a wide variety of students with uh, POTS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, Crohn's, diabetes, all the things, mental health conditions, anything that might impact a student. And so I spend a lot of time working with students and families on thinking about the student's needs and how it might be different from what they need in a high school setting. So in high school, you're typically at home with your guardians, with your parents, and um, a lot of things might be sort of done for you or you have systems for them. Same within the school setting, there are accommodations. You might have a paraeducator, a one-on-one -on -one support aid, um, a lot more things and supports. College is a little bit different. We learned that it's under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and, and provides reasonable accommodations. And so sometimes the types of accommodations and the things you might need in a college setting can be different, especially if your student wants to live on campus, then there's a lot more considerations. The types of accommodations are more robust. It's academic, it's residential, it could be recreation, we could have dining accommodations, programmatic accommodations. And here we have some um, considerations or some possible accommodations specifically for students with physical disabilities. And I do just wanna note there are two pictures on the side and the top one is a photo from uh, the University of Florida. Um, and I, I grabbed that shot because University of Florida is, is one of a very small handful of schools that actually has um, accessible, super accessible dorm rooms over, over, over the top of compliance. They have built in uh, lifts and, and things like that. And they have sort of used, they have one dorm that's sort of universally designed. Um, which is just interesting. So I put a picture of that there. And the bottom picture is um, a student I used to work with and her friend um, rolling around at Georgetown University. And I always just love that photo and she gave me permission to use it. So we're using it here. Um, so the types of accommodations, the academic accommodations might be similar to what a student had in the high school setting. So things like extra time on an exam, a student might also get priority registration because if they have a personal care need or personal care attendance or things that have to happen in the morning, bowel routines, bladder routines, medications, you name it, um, priority registration can help them choose their classes before everybody else and make sure that they have enough time in between classes for toileting, for eating, for tube feeding, for whatever the things might be. Um, laptop in a classroom could be a reasonable accommodation. Relocation of classes. The threshold for college is that um, colleges have to reduce barriers to access. So that does not necessarily mean that every building on that college campus needs to be accessible for the student, but rather that the college needs to make accommodations to make all of the classes accessible for the student. So classroom relocation could be a reasonable accommodation. So they're moving the student's classes to a building that is accessible for the student. Um, flexible attendance and flexible deadlines that's a that's a trickier one. That's something that you'll have to work out out with individual professors. The student might be approved for that accommodation, but they still have to connect with each professor. And I should say too that when a student goes to college, the student's responsibility is to connect with the disability support office. So your student is going to be self advocating. They're going to be having conversations with the disability support office. The disability support office is going to be connecting with them to see what their needs are. When they get approved for an accommodation, they get what is known as an accommodation letter. And then the student is responsible for getting that information to each of their individual professors every single semester. And ideally students are creating a rapport, having conversations with their, with their professors so that they're navigating things in advance so that they're having conversations up front. So everybody's on the same page. Residential accommodations, so the dorm, as we used to call it, now we call them residence halls. Um, but it might be an ADA accessible room. Um, 
It could be allowing the student to have a personal care attendant. And here's an important piece. Colleges do not provide one on one aides or paraeducators. So if your student has an aide in high school, whether that's um, an aide just to help them get things out of their bags, or if they have nursing support, colleges don't provide that. So a student needs to hire, manage, fund their own personal care attendants. And we're gonna be doing a webinar on that next week. So if you have questions about that, you should attend that one too. Um, and the accommodation would be to allow the student to have a personal care attendant in the dorm room with them or in the classroom with them. So that's just something to think about. Um, accessibility of the space for the student. Maybe we're thinking about a lower floor or a ground level room for emergency evacuation region, reasons. That's just important to think about. Housing accommodation requests are done separately from academic accommodations at pretty much every institution. Usually housing requests are due first thing once the student commits to the school um, in that May, June timeframe. So the student needs to be ready to have that documentation. And ideally, um, when I'm working with students, we talk about how they can connect with disability support offices, ask questions and get information before they apply to the school and before they commit to the school, because you wanna know that information before you sign that dotted line. Recreation accommodations, uh, we might be talking about adaptive fitness equipment, chairlifts for the pool, accessible student center facilities, um, you know, things that your student likes to engage in. Do they like to do gaming? If there is a gaming center on campus in the student union, then your students should have access to accessible gaming equipment if that's something that they need and that's something that the college should provide. Um, dining accommodations, it might be food allergies or diets. We need to look into those pieces. Each school is a little bit different in how they navigate that. Could be support in the dining hall too. We also need to be thinking about programmatic accommodations and transportation accommodations. Um, how can the student navigate the campus? Do they have shuttle buses? Are they accessible? Do they provide point to point transportation for students with disabilities? Um, you know, these are the sort of things that we need to look at a little bit more critically when we're talking about a student who is using a wheelchair or a mobility device um, or crutches or whatever to get around that campus. How are they going to navigate the campus? Because the fact is that there's just a lot more movement in college, right? Especially if a student's living on a college campus. They live in a dorm, but then they go to a class, they go to a dining hall. So they're just moving around a lot more. Um, Adrian, did you want to pipe in on this slide? Yeah, um, in terms of support um, in college, I know we kind of talked about this a little bit, but colleges are all required to, to support students by providing reasonable accommodations under the ADA. So um, in terms of getting those accommodations, I know we talked about this timeline is, is really important. And um, once a student decides where they want to go, which I mentioned National Decision Day being May 1st, that said, some students send in their deposits much earlier and you can begin the accommodations process as soon as you make the decision and put down that that preliminary deposit. So it could be in February, it could be in March. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, and then most colleges offer educational support to all students. There's going to be other tutoring center, a math center, a writing center, subject um, areas, and sometimes those are provided by peer tutors who have done well in the classes. Sometimes they're professional tutors or learning specialists. That information is specific to each college. So um, that would be something you would wanna take a look at under each college, you'll say academic, and then probably like support or tutoring. You can find that pretty easily on the websites. Um, and then some colleges will offer academic support um, where you could you could meet with like a professional who maybe is certified or master's level um, person who has an expertise in and whether it be like in learning or a particular subject. Um, and they might help focus on executive functioning, um, such as time management, study skills, like staying organized, all of those skills. Um, are really important. Sometimes that is included in the tuition and then sometimes that is a fee for service. So that's again, something to check out on each specific college website. Um, and then finally, um, there are specific programs at some colleges that support students who have learning disabilities, ADD or ADHD. Um, and, and those typically will definitely have a fee there. Um, if it is like say two meetings a week for an hour with a learning specialist, um, you know, that would not be included in tuition, depending on the university, um, and that would be listed on the website. 
Um, and finally, the outside support option. So there are students who say, I really want to go to this one particular college. Um, and, and maybe they don't have enough support available on campus and families are able to um, hire an executive functioning coach through a third party program or um, a live in program such as the college living experience or college internship program CLE or CIP. And those provide 24 seven support with people who are on staff to help with the independent living piece uh, of the college transition. And then as far as personal care goes, Annie and I are going to be talking about that more specifically next week, but the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Wright State are the only colleges at the moment in the United States that are offering um, personal care, um, either personal care stations or personal care attendant program. Otherwise, it would be you know something that the family would have to hire outside of the university. Yep, and there are, um, this is Annie again, and there are limits to sort of the amount of hours and things that even at both of those universities that they will supply, but they often support students in figuring out and navigating how to find other personal care attendants for other hours because many students need uh, 24 hour care, right? So um, that's just to give you a good sense of what is available. Um, in terms of campus culture, you know, we mentioned this, all colleges have disability support offices, the names all vary. So you'll have to do a little bit of research on that end. Um, and some colleges are more forward facing about accessibility and disability on campus. So I always encourage people to look and see, go to the campus map or put in the name of the school and accessible campus map into a Google search and see what pops up. Some schools will actually outline their accessible routes. They'll have pictures, they'll have descriptions of where the doors are, uh, what the building structure is, if there's elevators, if there's not. Um, and, you know, it can tell you a lot about the university sort of based on how they are putting themselves out publicly. Um, DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that include disability, that's another thing to sort of just look for. How are they talking about disability on their campus? Are they talking about disability on their campus at all? Um, that can that can give you some clues. Some colleges have disability clubs or groups that are student focused and student started. Um, so you might want to look for that. And a few colleges, I think about 20 right now, have disability cultural centers. And these are identity spaces. Um, they're activism spaces for students to learn about disability history and culture and to gather. Those are separate from disability support offices. But um, if your student is interested in sort of what, you know, disability identity looks like, they might want to look at a school that has a strong uh, disability cultural center or a strong disability identity. Um, so some of the key things too, just as we're wrapping up, self-advocacy, you, you hear that a lot, it's very important. Uh, students need to be able to talk about their disability. They need to be able to articulate just sort of what their needs are. And the more that they practice that in those 504, in those IEP meetings uh, with their healthcare providers in the community, the easier it's gonna get. They need to know what their needs are. They need to know about like, how do they, how do they eat? What is their, you know, how do they sleep? How do they manage all of these things? Parents, I'm a parent myself. Adrian is also a parent. We get it. We understand that sometimes you have to sort of, uh, you know, manage things for your student, but it's really important as your student is aging and becoming, you know, moving into adulthood that we're giving them a peek behind the curtain so that they understand how the food got in their lunch bag, that they know the process and the steps that go into doing laundry or getting something done. So that's really important. Make a list of those things that you're doing for your student now and bring them into the conversation. Um, students need to be prepared so that things, if they don't work out perfectly, they have plans. Um, Adrian and I have a resource list. I put a QR code here, but I will also pop into the chat just a direct link to this document. Um, it has links to my website, accessiblecollege.com and Adrian's website as well. And um, I have a program with the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, so students with any type of paralysis, which is uh, covers a lot of all of the conditions in the MDA family of, of um, neuromuscular conditions, can work with me for free for up to three hours. So there's information on that sheet about that and our contact information as well. Um, so you can check that information out. And there we go, and I'll put it up here too. And I'll, I'll put the link to that resource sheet too um, in, the, in the chat in a second. Um, 
and I'll leave this up for a second. And I think we did that in exactly 45 minutes, Marissa. So, um, oh, it was a lot of information jam packed in there, but such yep. great information. And I always enjoy hearing you present. Um, so thank you both, uh, Adrian and Annie. Um, before we jump into our panel discussion, I did have a few questions that I just wanted to ask the 2 of you. Um, how early do you try to start ensuring that all these supports are in place? Um, that's a great, I'll jump in and take that. So, uh, by supports, I'm guessing that the person is talking about the accommodations process. Um, I think Adrian and I would both agree that you should start thinking about your accommodations and your needs as early as possible in the college search process. So most students start tuning in for real junior year of high school because there's a lot more conversation in their schools about college and going to college. So that means that students should start investigating the accommodations that they might need. They should talk to the disability support offices. Um, a lot of the work that I do with students is actually getting them ready for those conversations and thinking through those needs. Um, because it's not just about those pieces, but it's also continuity of care and independent living. So we need to start preparing students early. Um, no college will guarantee accommodations before the student has committed to the college and provided the documentation. Very rarely will you have a school say, oh, you're thinking about coming here? Tell me what you need. Yes, we'll give you all of those things. That likely won't happen. So we, we need to be very... Um, tactful and crafty in how we're getting the information that we're getting from the disability support offices so that your student can make an informed decision, you know, as they're as they're getting those approved those uh, college acceptances in. Oh, great. Um, another question that came from registration is um, what might you say to somebody who they need 24 seven care? So they're thinking mostly about going to online school. Um, any recommendations, suggestions, are there accommodations online? Is there a way for them to possibly go to in-person school? So, yes, uh, students can, if they're going to an online college or university or taking an online course, you can get accommodations for online schools. Um, any school that gets federal funding, which is pretty much every single college in the United States, there are about 4,500 colleges and universities across the U.S., uh, there's a small handful, maybe four or five that are not federally funded. Um, and, and any college that ha is federally funded has to provide reasonable accommodations. So online, in person, whatever, they have to provide reasonable accommodations. They all have a process for that. Um, if your student needs 24 seven care, uh, it's a more complicated question about whether or not they should or could go to an in-person school, right? So, so there's obviously some things to consider. Um, whether or not they can find a personal care attendant. Some of that depends on funding and things like that, whether they have Medicaid, SSI, all of these little pieces. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about that next week in our in our webinar, so I would encourage this person to come. But I can say from personal experience, I've supported a number of students who have 24 seven care and live on a college campus. Um, you know, there are some things that have to be considered and thought through, and it's not always perfect situation, but it can be done. So I think that um, I always, when I'm working with students, ask them like what they want for their college experience, right? And we work from there to figure out if it's reasonable or not. Great, thank you. Um, I think we can go into the next part of our um, program, which we wanted to, let me get myself situated here a little bit. Um, we wanted to start a panel discussion um, and including Annie and Adrian in this panel, um, but also wanted to welcome um, some students um, who have been through the college uh, application process are currently at college or have graduated. Um, so I'm going to welcome them. Chase, are you on? I believe I saw you and I see Peyton and Liza. Great. Thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to see you. Um, I would love for you each to just take a moment to introduce yourselves. Um, tell us where you are going to school or where you graduated from your area of study. 
uh, what you liked the most about college. Um, so why don't we just start with Liza? I see you first on my screen here, so I'll put you on the spot. All good. I'm happy to be on the spot. Um, I'm Liza. I'm originally from Colorado. I have spinal muscular atrophy, so I am in a chair and I do require um, care uh, the majority of the time, not quite 24 seven, but not too far from it. Um, and then I went to my undergrad at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. I recently graduated in May and now I am in Williamsburg, Virginia, going to law school. So I know all about it. I am my own employer for all my own caregivers. So I've done all that. So I know a ton about that. And then I also have advocated and gotten more than enough accommodations for everything I need at both universities. So I've worked with those as well. Wonderful. Law school. That's great. Um, Peyton, you introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Peyton. Um, I'm graduated from undergrad uh, a couple years ago in 2022 from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and I'm currently uh, getting my PhD in clinical psychology also at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and I have Charcot Marie Tooth or CMT. Um, so I can walk, um, but I wear leg braces and use a scooter for longer distances, um, which I'm happy to, to chat about more later about how that was at college. But yeah, that's me. Great. Thanks for being here, Peyton. And Chase. Uh, hi, I'm Chase. I have a uh, Friedberg's Saxia. Um, so uh, I use a wheelchair to get around. Um, I'm a senior at UNC Charlotte uh, studying communications. I'm thinking about getting a master's, but I'm still kind of feeling it out, but, but yeah, so that's about it. Um, Thank you, Chase. And I hear you there. I took some time off in between my bachelor's and master's to kind of, kind of yeah. figure things out. So nothing wrong with that. Um, well, thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate it. Um, we have some questions prepared, um, but if there are questions coming in through the chat that um, anybody has, please feel free to enter them in the chat and we'll um, make sure we stop and, and get to those as well. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, what factors went into your decision to attend college? Are there any factors that you specifically looked at when you applied to colleges? And whoever would like to start? Can can go for it. I guess I'll go ahead. Um, I took into account and I really prioritized all of the normal factors. I didn't mind like I knew going into it, I was definitely going to have to be advocating um, for myself. And it really, I there was one school I did look at disability services and I did talk to them before going in and, you know, make sure they like, you know, at the very least were willing to work with me. Um, but I didn't mind if I was going to have to push a little bit. Um, and really my decision ended up being between two different schools. One that had an extremely set up disability services program, um, uh, Denver University, and they had worked with people that was the same um, disability as I have same type needs, things like that, and then loyal to Marymount. And the thing is, I just like, for all the normal reasons, loved loyal to Marymount. And like, it was like, I definitely was gonna have to set up more stuff there and do more work there. And I was like, I know I'm a person who can do that and I wanna do that. So like now, if anyone wanted to go there, it's set up, they know what to do. There's like all the things in place, um, but you kinda gotta take that leap if it really comes down to it, if you're willing to do that. Thank you. You were a trailblazer then. You paved the way for someone else. That's great. Peyton, how about you? What went in what factors went into your decision? Yeah, I think I was kind of similar. Like I think um, I was really interested in either going into medicine or into uh, clinical psychology as a freshman. Um, so I really picked a school that had good programs there, um, but I also paid a lot of attention to campus accessibility too. 
Um, so, you know, there was a couple campuses that I had toured where it was just very hilly, uh, which would make it very difficult for me to get around. Um, so those ended up not being my top schools for other reasons too, um, but that was definitely like something that I took into consideration as well. How about you, Chase? Were there specific things you looked at when choosing where you went to school? Uh, the biggest thing for me was it was pretty close to home. Uh, so it was fairly easy to get to. Um, also, I have a lot of friends who also have muscular dystrophy. And they go to UNC Charlotte. And uh, so I was able to hear from them how it was in terms of accessibility so yeah that it really inspired me to go there and i'm glad i did because it's really good 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 annie and adrian are there factors that folks should consider that maybe they don't think about that just don't pop in to their minds when they're thinking about school um, I guess I would say, you know, when when you're going to visit schools, I think, you know, being there and, and taking the campus tour can be really, really helpful and um, being on campus. I know for some it's it's hard to visit, but for the schools that you're really interested in, I think going on campus makes a huge difference. And um, Annie and I both encourage students to feel comfortable to reach out to the disabilities or accessibility office. Um, they will sit down with you. You can make an appointment. You can speak with them um, because admissions and the accessibility office are two separate offices. They are not going to be speaking, and that's not something that the accessibility or disability office isn't going to then call admissions um, and share any you know personal information. So we do encourage students to to have those visits and have those appointments. And if you can't make it in person, then you know the virtual options are also there too. Um, and I'll just add um, quickly, I really loved what Liza said about, um, you know, sharing um, about just guiding your college search process like, um, you know, like your like like any other student. Right. So so with your interests, with the, the clubs that you're interested in, the major that you're interested in, the campus culture that you're interested in. Um, I think students with disabilities should guide their college search just like any other student um, and factor in some of the accessibility and disability related needs and, and pieces. Um, and that's where I think also like having that having that connection with the people in the disability support office and vetting the people in the disability support office to 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 discern and to figure out if those people are going to be helpful to you. Is going to be huge um, in that process, and it sounds like uh, that that was something that all of uh, all of the students on the panel did is you know look into those into those pieces. But first and foremost, the student has to be happy at the school, right, at the university with the with the culture and with the the education. Um, and so I think that's really important. And Adrian honed in on like going on tours too. It should be noted that students can request accommodations for tours as well. Mm -hmm. So hopefully when you go to the tour website, uh, there's a space where you can request an accommodation for a tour and let them know that you need an accessible tour, um, you know, things like that. Some schools even offer golf cart tours, accessible golf carts mm -hmm. as well, depending on the school and sort of what their setup is. Um, if there is no place to request an accommodation for the tour, the student can also uh, connect with the admissions office and the tour department to ask for an accommodation and to ask for what they need. So I think that's just important for people to know going in. Definitely. Um, transportation has come up a fair amount, um, both in questions we got before the um, webinar today and, and even during. Um, what types of transportation, and this is for, for our students or alumni, um, what types of transportation did you use or do you use to get around campus and to go off campus to things like medical appointments or other, other things? I guess I'll take it unless someone else wants to, um, since I brought it up in the chat. Um, but I had a car on campus. Um, Los Angeles, to be very honest, has 
absolutely horrible public transportation. Um, hopefully they fix that in the next coming years. Um, but I had a car on campus and my caregivers would drive me everywhere I needed to go. And I made sure that I had that. And also like my friends would drive me if I wanted to go somewhere with them. So I just kind of had it more that way. Um, Cause it was definitely not a problem finding someone who had a license who wanted to get off campus or go somewhere. I did live on campus though um, for my entire undergrad. Um, going into grad school though, I was like, okay, I think I've had my time on campus. I wanna live off campus. So I'm currently off campus, um, but I made sure that I'm in within a very close walking distance to campus. Um, and so I, with my power chair, can easily get to and from campus, not a problem. Um, and so that's what I'm doing most days, but same thing, I have a car and my caregivers can take me. I find that's more reliable than trying to figure out like an accessible um, Uber or something like that, although they do have that. And even the campus I'm currently on does have a handicap accessible shuttle um, for students with disabilities. Um, and then also public transportation and buses is typically a very reliable source. Um, DC's Metro is really good and reliable too. I've been on that multiple times. New York, not so much. Um, I can speak to a lot of different places, but that's general gist. Thank you. Anyone else? I think you basically covered everything. Um, I think the one other thing that I didn't think about um, when I was going to college was um, I only got a car um, my junior year. Um, so I, you know, was on campus for the two years before that. Um, but the way that my college's parking was, is it was zoned. So you get a parking permit that gives you like a specific zone that you have to park in. And you can't park outside of that zone, like even with an accessible sticker. And mm -hmm. so you know, for example, if I had a zone two parking permit, I can only park in one part of campus. Um, and so that created some challenges for sure, um, just because, you know, I had to walk some longer distances and stuff like that. So I think that was one thing that I wish I would have just known going into it. I kind of found out last minute. Um, but yeah, I think otherwise, I think you covered everything. A great point. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. So this is Annie. I'm, I'm just going to add um, one thing, which is that, um, you know, for cars on campus, like if a student needs to have a car on their college campus, um, sometimes colleges don't allow students to have cars on campus or they don't allow them to have them first year. Um, so that might be a reasonable accommodation that a student could request. Um, students would still be required sort of what Peyton was saying that to, you know, pay the general parking fee to have park on campus uh, because everybody has to pay that fee. But um, there might be an accommodation that you can get or depending on like, you know, the, the school to set up the situation, having parking that's closer uh, to your residence hall or to the place that you are um, are going to could be a thing that you're talking with the disability support office about. So I think it's just like every college situation might be a little unique, but that's something for folks to, to know about and think about. Um, it's really important too, that some people uh, don't realize that not every college has transportation. So some colleges don't have shuttles. They don't have any transportation on campus for anyone. Um, and so, um, you know, thinking about how the student is getting from point A to point B, and thinking about topography, weather, uh, you know, is there snow and ice? Uh, how do they manage that, right? Um, what about the hills? What about cobblestones or historic campuses with bricks and things like that? And so those are just important considerations when somebody's thinking about living in a place nine months out of the year and whether or not if you're using a power chair, if you want to be going over cobblestones, um, you know, all day, every day or not. And that's a personal decision. So it's just important that students are sort of thinking about what that feels like for a majority of their time. Annie or Adrian, are there any resources for transportation? I've heard before, like vocational rehab in some states might be able to help. Um, can you share anything or, or Liza or anybody on the panel? I, I mean, this is Annie, I'll, I'll pipe in again. 
uh, every student should connect with their voc rehab in, um, in their state. Uh, it has different names in every state, but if you go to your state name uh, and put in vocational rehabilitation, it'll probably take you to the correct page. Um, so vocational rehabilitation might provide funding for transportation, for tuition, for assistive technology, for a variety of things. Um, so it sort of depends on what you're asking for. Uh, so, you know, it might be local transportation. Um, there might be services or supports in that county or in that city. You might be able to uh, sign up for accessible transit if they have a public transportation system and get that for free. Uh, so, Voc Rehab is a good resource for those things. And I will stop talking and let other panelists chime in. I think that really covers it. Um, Definitely, you know, look into what the city has. A lot of cities do have accessible transportation. Um, oddly enough, if you look at like, it sounds kind of weird and it's kind of horrible, but more like elderly services, that's where you're going to find a lot of those handicapped accessible transportation rides and also just like emergency services um, because they exist um, mostly for the elderly and then we kind of fall into the category. Um, but that is a resource to look at, um, but I think we covered everything else for the most part. Thank you. Um, what were or what are uh, the biggest challenges that you have faced or are facing as a college student? Are there challenges that you encountered and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I can I can start on this one uh, if nobody else wants to jump in. But I think um, a couple of different things. I think one, just physical accessibility, like we've been talking about. Um, you know, the college campuses are not required to be all accessible, so there are definitely some some physical obstacles there um, that you'll you know figure out how to navigate. Um, but that's just definitely kind of a learning curve and trying to figure out you know what kind of um, adaptive devices you might need or whatever. Like I decided to get a mobility scooter like my sophomore year just to make it easier for me to get around campus and things like that. Um, I also think just, you know, at, at least in my experience, and maybe this isn't true at other colleges, but I think um, I really had to do a lot of advocacy to get the accommodations that I needed approved. Um, and so I think knowing what accommodations I needed to be able to, to function and knowing kind of my rights within the ADA um, was really helpful for, for pushing back against, you know, professors that maybe didn't want to let me use accommodations or um, the disability offices in some cases. Um, so I think, um, yeah, just kind of knowing, knowing my rights and those kind of things, because um, it can be really tricky to advocate for yourself sometimes, but also I think really important, like you were saying. So. I'll jump in there um, next and I also see the question that went into and it kind of goes into this as well. Um, for me, the hardest issues were really finding caregivers um, and mostly just dealing with all the um, challenges that came with like, you know, making sure I just had the help I needed when I needed it. Um, and also finding that balance between, you know, doing things as anyone else would, going out with friends, you know, taking a risk and just, you know, stepping away um, from my caregiver for a little bit and like really trying to do some other things. And I've gotten really good at that. Um, and so it's made life a lot easier um, and it's fun too. Um, but I also had some very significant health issues in college. Um, there was one point where I was on bed rest for an entire month in the middle of the semester. Um, and I also um, had surgery one semester. Um, so I had a lot of those things come up and I'm a very due diligent student. I am a nerd through and through. Um, and so no matter what I was going through, I would always like be like, okay, just give me the work. Tell me what I need to do. I'm not going to be there, um, but I will do it. And meeting with professors and luckily after the pandemic, one good thing that came out of it is you can join classes via Zoom, even if you're just doing it just because like my friends would Zoom me into class when I was gone for that month. Um, and my professors worked with me and make sure I had everything um, for that. And so really just like 
don't like let yourself be shut down as those barriers and those hurdles come up because I can promise you they will um, and expect that and be ready to figure it out and just know that there is a solution to every problem you're going to find. You just have to work for it and you have to find it. And when you do, it's going to be great. Um, but just keep going. So that's, that's the biggest thing. I love that, Liza. I remember speaking to somebody who had left college because they just felt like there was too many barriers. And so I love that you are sharing that there is, there is a way, there's a way. So, um, Anybody else have anything they wanted to share? There was a question in the chat, which I know Liza addressed of, you know, how do you deal with health issues that came up that where you had to miss school? Um, where your professors, it sounds like for Liza, they were accommodating um, any Chase or Peyton. Uh, I can answer this one. Great. Um, so I've been lucky enough to where I haven't had that many long term health issues, but if something if something ever comes up, um, the first thing I'll do is just email professors, uh, stay in contact with the disability department, just really stay on top of like everything that you can, send out emails when you need to, uh, just let everybody know what's going on and what you need to do and how much time you need. Great advice. Thank you. Marissa, this is Annie. Can I add something too? Um, I loved what Liza and, and um, Chase just offered because I think it gives like a really a good example of a nurturing, caring school environment, right? Which is sort of for me just hones in on the point that when students are researching schools, it's important to find a school that will take that holistic approach to student education, right? Um, it sounds like, you know, both Liza and Chase were in environments where they they have those good connections with their professors. They've created those relationships, right? And um, schools that are willing to be more flexible, right? So um, something that Liza said was, you know, having remote access to education, um, that's not a guarantee. Not every school will provide that as a reasonable accommodation. It sounds like her friends just set it up for her and maybe turned their laptops around in the classroom and made it happen, which is totally cool. That is an informal accommodation. Um, but but there are some schools where you might get pushback, where a professor might say, um, you know, I'm not. That's not something I can provide, or they might not have the technology to provide that in the in the classroom for whatever reason, or it might not work with that class because it's more hands on. Um, there's there's a lot of sort of things to sort of work through with that, um, but you know that is that is something I want to make sure that people know that they aren't guaranteed that accommodation, right? And then the other piece too, it, it sort of depends on like what happens to you in that health situation where you meet need to miss like how many days are we talking? Are we talking about two weeks? Are we talking about a month or two months? And at what point you are in the semester? That is where it's really important to have a good rapport with the disability support office and with your academic advisor so that you can have these conversations like, do I need to withdraw from this class at this point? Am I going to be able to make up this work or do this work independently? Because some of us, you know, might need more uh, instruction and might not be able to take on what Liza took on and doing the work independently, right? Um, and, and every program is different. Every class is a little bit different. So establishing those good relationships is going to be really, really important for, for students. So um, I would say, again, this is a space where doing that research up front, starting early, sophomore or junior year of high school, thinking about it, researching, investigating, having conversations, it's going to be really important to help you make the best college choice. Thank you, Annie. It's a great, great point that you make. Every college is so, so different. Um, and that actually leads into our next question was um, wanted to hear from Chase and, and Liza and Peyton of what was your experience like with the Office of Dis Disabilities? Was, how'd you build that relationship? What did that look like? Um, so if you could share a little bit about that. I guess I'll take that one to start. Um, I, so for undergrad, I, 
emailed them like as soon as I was like, I'm going here. I immediately got in touch with them, um, emailing the president and the vice president of the disability um, services center um, and like setting up a meeting with them, talking with them. Um, I have a just tendency whenever I'm submitting like the paperwork for any disability accommodation ever, I decide I wanna give them an entire textbook and I literally just submit every single itty bitty tiny piece of paperwork I have my entire health record, all the doctor's notes, like dating back to when I was in elementary school and my elementary school IEP, my mom did a great job of saving everything. They get everything. Um, they don't wanna read that much. They're more likely to just approve it. Um, and so that's like kind of what I've done um, when I submit the paperwork. I did that for my um, graduate school too. And I also did it for the LSAT board when I had to take my law school exams. Um, and they're always just like, yeah, okay. Like you're telling me everything. Okay. Um, so that's one of the ways where I've done it. Um, and then really just making sure you stay in contact with them. They know what you need. Um, you have that relationship for, for with them. Um, it's kind of nice in my grad school. They have like a point person who is pretty much the liaison with the grad school and the disability services office. Um, and he's actually the Dean of Students. Um, and so I have a cell phone number and you can bet if something happens to me and I need to contact them, I'm just gonna call him um, and be like, hey, like, uh, help me. Um, and so really having that person and just creating that relationship, going to coffee with the president of the disability services office and, you know, doing like that upfront. So they know you're a person, they care about you and they wanna make sure you get what you need. Um, so really that's, that's what I did. Great. Thank you. Chase or Peyton, anything you want to share about how you went about developing a good relationship with the office of disability? Uh, I can start. Um, so for me, uh, getting to know everybody at the disability office was, um, I was pretty stressed because I had just graduated from my community college and I was transferring over to a four year. And so um, there was a lot that I had to sort out, a lot of emails that I had to send. I had to complete the whole, uh, Community college uh, graduation transfer problem, um, and that that's a lot of work uh, for an able-bodied student, even. But on top of that, I deal with uh, the uh, the disability department at my school, and uh, a lot of that was uh, sending emails to my care team, uh, making sure they had all the right documents so that it will be a smooth transition for me um it ended up working out but it was for for a few weeks it was pretty pretty stressful <laughs> great thank you so getting to know everybody in that office seems to be a good yep. a good approach right yeah I can, um, I think for me, like it really, um, I kind of tried to take the same approach as Liza. And um, as soon as I got into WashU, um, emailed the office and got all the paperwork in and set up a meeting. And my freshman year, they were fantastic. Um, I actually have some hearing loss with my disability too. Um, so they sat down with me for a good like two hours to try to try out different technologies and uh, figure out what was going to work best for me. Um, so they were they were absolutely fantastic. Um, we had a change of leadership um, my sophomore year, and um, he more so, I think, views the disabilities office, um, you said before, as just kind of an obligation to make sure that the college doesn't get sued. Um, so people have a little bit of a hard time um, getting disability accommodations now um, just because of um, kind of how that leadership approaches accommodations. So it's, it's a little trickier now. Um, I think most people that you talk to um, from my college who have interacted with the office um, will tell you that they've had to advocate a lot. 
Um, but it's it's worked out. I've been able to get all the accommodations that I need and, um, you know, have a good relationship with the office. So it, it works out. It just takes a little bit of advocacy sometimes. So. Yeah. Now that brings up another uh, good question for Annie and Adrian. Um, what advice might you have for someone who is struggling to have a good relationship with the Office of Disabilities? They're not getting answers. They're not hearing back. They're getting pushback. What What would you suggest? <clears throat> well, uh, it sort of depends on the situation. So, um, you know, I, I think that some colleges are very upfront about how much time it takes them to evaluate documentation. They, they'll post that on their website. At some schools, it might say, like, you send us this stuff and you can expect to hear from us in four to six weeks, right? So, um, so if you're at a school that has sort of a longer turnaround time, um, you might just have to wait because that office is likely understaffed, underfunded, and doesn't have a ton of resources. Um, and that is why you might want to do, you know, that upfront research when you're looking at schools and having conversations with disability support offices to see, you know, how often do you see students? Um, how quickly can I get in to connect with you? Because those, those, those things are really different. If there is a discriminatory act, that's a different uh, can of worms. Um, students have some uh, resources at their disposal if, if they feel like there's been some discrimination. Um, usually there is an internal grievance process with every institution. So the student can make a, a complaint um, to their university's um, equity office about you know, any, any grievance that they have. And usually that is on the disability support office website or the institution has an internal grievance policy. Further up, if there's a bigger, if you're being discriminated against because of your disability, um, you can make a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights, um, which is a federal agency. Um, those things don't tend to move very quickly, though. So I, I would say that um, it's probably good at that point to sort of circle the wagons and have conversations with, you know, trusted advisors and parents to see what, you know, who, how we can escalate a situation to get something resolved for a student. But one thing that I tell students all the time that I think is just a great adulting tip is to keep receipts. And by that, I mean, you know, everything in writing or it never happened. If you make a request for something, put it in an email. If you have a conversation with a professor and they say, oh, sure, you can hand that thing in two weeks late. I don't care. Go back home and or go to your phone and say, dear professor, so and so, it was so great talking to you today. It sounds like you're fine with me handing this in on X date. And, you know, I look forward to working with you create that paper trail so that you have receipts so that you have something should something emerge later on. That's really, really important. Um, you know, there was something too that uh, Peyton said a little bit earlier about um, changes in the office staff too. There is a lot of turnover in disability support offices. Um, so, you know, that is something to be aware of that that could happen. Things change, people move on, people leave positions. Um, the other thing that sort of stuck out to me was that um, Liza and Peyton both said that they contacted the disability support offices after they had committed, which is great. That's the time most people connect with the disability support offices. But I do want people to know that you can, as a prospective student, there is nothing that is preventing a student from talking to the disability support office while they are engaging in the college search process, just to get a sense of how that office operates, to get more information, to get details. Um, I would say that if you have, you know, a neuromuscular condition, you should, when you reach out as a prospective student, it might be helpful to share that you have XYZ condition. Um, they get a lot of outreach, disability support offices do, from a lot of different people. Majority of students who are requesting accommodations have learning disabilities, mental health conditions, or ADD. There are sort of typical accommodations that are provided for those conditions. Uh, for physical disabilities, it would make sense to someone on the other side of the desk why someone might be reaching out and wanting more information, you know, as a prospective student. So I think that um, people should know that they can get that information sort of upfront and get a sense of what accommodations they might be approved for should they choose to go there. Because that could impact your choice, right? You might meet with those people and say like, you know what? 
I can get the same education at this school and the people were a lot nicer and cooler and willing to work with me. So um, that that might impact your choice. So I just I just want people to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, thank you very much for sharing that. I want to just shift gears in the last few minutes that we have here and ask um, about getting involved socially at your school. Uh, so academics, that's you know, we've talked a lot about that, but what about socially? How did you get involved at your school? What advice might you give to a future student that's looking to make friends, looking to get involved um, in the culture of the college? I can go. I did way too much. Um, <laughs> okay, so I was a tour guide on campus. Um, I was part of a service organization on campus and did a lot of volunteer work. Um, I also was part of like a few small clubs and organizations. I was part of like the interfaith council. I was on three different boards on my campus. Um, I was out there and crazy and doing way too much. And then on top of that, I had three majors. Um, so just a little bit, I don't recommend that. Um, but find what you love and do that and you know put yourself in that um i did all the millions of little things in my undergrad but for grad school i'm gonna do two things um i have to try out for both things i hope i get in um but i'm gonna do moot court so it's like a fake court on um, supreme court trial thing and then a journal um at my law school so that's like i want to put myself into two things and i'm gonna really dedicate myself to that but, you know, find friends, go out, um, you know, go get coffee with people. Just, you know, say hi, be social. Um, if you see someone there just, you know, sitting by themselves, go talk to them. Um, you know, just kind of butt in and say hi and be friendly and, you know, you'll meet people and you'll find those you really like. And, you know, others that might not be your best friend, but just be nice to everybody and you'll find your group. I like that. I like what you said about finding what you're interested in and just going after that. So great. Chase or Peyton? I completely agree with that. I like love what you said, Liza, about just like doing what you love and then you'll kind of connect with the people who are like-minded and enjoy the same things. Um, I think that was really true for me too. I got involved in a bunch of different clubs, um, a lot of different like volunteer organizations and stuff like that and ended up meeting some really cool people through that. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's a really personal choice whether you're open about your disability or not. Um, but for me, I found that the people around me kind of follow my lead about um, how they view my disability. Um, so if I'm open about it and accepting of it, then they're kind of more likely to be that way too. Um, so I kind of tend to approach um, social situations like that and I'm very open about it. And I found that to be really helpful as well. Um, but that's also a very personal choice. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, just my two cents. Thank you. How about you, Chief? Uh, yeah, pretty much, uh, pretty much what they said, just, uh meeting new people through different organizations and I started working at the student newspaper at my school so I met a lot of friends through that and uh I would say the most important thing is just probably just uh being yourself I would say um uh just you know I'm I make a lot of like jokes and jokes about like having a disability. I know a lot of people don't really like that, but I make those kind of jokes and I meet so many new people and they're they're really awesome. They they made my years at college just so much better. Yeah. Wonderful. Annie and Adrian, any um tips that you've come across along the way working with different students of how to help them get more involved, be more social, all that stuff. Um, this is Adrian here. Um, you know, at this time of year, I know in the beginning, some of the students are, you know, a little 
apprehensive at first, but I do think this is the, the time when like the club fair comes up. Every college, you know, has like a club fair where all the clubs usually come together on one day. So, you know, I often encourage students to go to that and, you know, challenge them to say, like, put your name down on like one or two lists of things that you are interested in and no pressure, but this is like a great step in the right direction to maybe joining an organization or two to meet new people. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I know we're at the end of our time. I feel like there's so much more we could still talk about, um, but I want to be cognizant of everybody's time today. Thank you so much, uh, Peyton and Liza and Chase for joining us. I think hearing directly from students is such a powerful way for us to learn. So thank you um, for being willing to share your experiences. And a huge thank you again to Annie and Adrian. Your expertise is just amazing. Um, and we love hearing from you. So thank you. And let me move forward here. I did also want to highlight again this uh, new resource that we have. This is our college planning timeline just posted to our website today. So you're some of the first to hear about it. We encourage you to download and use this timeline to help you keep it track of important things. Uh, several of the things that Annie and Adrian talked about are on this timeline because they helped us uh, put it together. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to collaborate with, with Annie and, and Adrian on it as well. So we hope that you will find it helpful. You can scan the QR code or click the link in the chat. Um, we'll also send it out through email. Uh, we also have a resource to assist in the transition from pediatric to adult care. So looking more at the medical piece of transition, um, it includes some self assessments challenges to really help youth take ownership of their medical care. Um, we'll put the link to this in the chat as well. So feel free to download that and, and utilize that. Um, don't forget to join us next Thursday, September 26 for part 2. Uh, Annie and Adrian will be back again to share their knowledge about uh, personal care attendance at college, including how to find them, how to hire, train, manage PCAs, um, and possible funding sources. So please make sure you're registered. We'll put that link in the chat as well. Just a quick plug that it would be great to see you in person this fall. We'll be hosting four different seminars or symposiums, one in Atlanta, one at Stanford, one in Irvine, California, and one in Dallas. If anybody would like to go, we do have travel stipends available. We would love to see people in person. And these are for any age, um, all different neuromuscular diseases. Um, it's a chance to meet clinicians, hear from them, and hear from other members of the community. So, and last but not least, we invite you to join the community. If you haven't uh, done so already, please go to mda.org slash join dash MDA. Joining is free. And we'd like to again thank our program supporter, Edwise Therapeutics. We appreciate their support of programs like this. We want to hear from you um, when you uh, uh, leave the webinar. Excuse me, when you leave the webinar, a uh, survey will pop up. Um, we want to hear what you liked about today's program, what we can do differently in the future. So please fill out that brief survey. And if you have any other questions or looking for support or resources, please feel free to contact our resource center. Um, at the number there on the screen. But thank you again to our panelists. Thank you again to Annie and Adrian. Um, and that concludes today's uh, webinar.